Welcome back to... Yes, I had to shave for something. I know I look like a child. Minus 1,000 aura points. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get it over with in the comments. I'm vulnerable. Be nice. I am a huge fan of Italy. I actually went to Italy five times between 2022 and 2023. Pesaro twice, Polignano Amare, and Rome twice. And I tried to go again this year. I love it. There's just something about it. The pace of life, the food, the weather, the scenery, the football, the wine. In another life, I'm a cool Italian called Alessandro who rides motorcycles and makes offbeat films about Genoa or something. So you should never be biased, but based on my love of Italy, his performances at the Euros and his striking resemblance to the old school Italian defenders, I always suspected I might like Riccardo Calafiori, but not this much. I used to say Nuno Tavares plays like he's in a YouTube compilation. That was the best way to me of summing up his game. And someone said the best way of describing Calafiori is he looks like he's playing with AirPods in on some beach somewhere listening to some Italian artist we'd never heard of, probably rolling a cigarette and nursing a Peroni. What have we signed here, boys and girls? As Mikel defenders go, this might be the archetype. Strong, tall, fast, intelligent, 360, seemingly good at everything. And best of all, he's really surprised me with the volume of aspects of his game that I just didn't see coming, despite doing a lot of watching. He is incredibly well-rounded. Naturally, when you look at someone on YouTube or Y Scout or over full 90s, as I did for Calafiori, for Bologna and for Italy, you want to focus on the off-ball stuff, but you do just end up focusing on the on-ball stuff. But what's really caught my eye with Calafiori in this early season is his off-ball running, especially with its repeatability and intelligence. Because it's all very well as a fullback running and supporting an attack, but where are you attacking? Where do you run? What spaces do you create when you run? Can you repeat it? How do you time it? And he does it brilliantly. Here he is knocking a ball into Rice before attacking the last line, opening up this pocket of space behind him, dragging a defender. He then hovers out wide. Then when Gabriel receives, he times his next run to perfection, remaining onside and attacking the space we've created in behind now. If he receives that, he's in. Against Southampton, he wins the ball back. Look at that technique, by the way. Just brushing it into his stride in total control. Then plays a beautiful line breaker into Havertz and carries on his run into the space with those long strides. He then recognises that Saka has a job on here as the entirety of the city of Southampton are trying to stop him. So he checks his run and finds the space that's now been created on the edge of the box. Then he times his box approach superbly as Saka goes on the outside to be there for the cutback in the Odegaard zone. And as the ball ricochets around, he's nearly there for the tap-in. Against City, he was more conservative, but you could still see his intent to always be positive. As the ball's in the air here, he's the one tucking forward, anticipating it going up the pitch, being ready to have the run on his marker. Here he is tucking around the back of the City players, getting dragged forward, receiving, then playing a lovely layoff to Partey, before again attacking the space where he's comfortable centrally. And before he actually scored the goal against City, he was already picking up those positions on the edge of the box where the space was when we went forward. Little moment here from the Leicester game I absolutely loved. He wins the ball back, then goes hunting inside, running around every Leicester player like a dog after a tennis ball. And as the ball breaks outside of the Leicester player's control, he changes his run on the fly, changing defence to attack in an instant and attacking the space. It's hard to do it justice in screenshots. Just go look up that time code in the top left and watch it. The decision making in an instant is just pure instinct. Subtle intelligence, subtle movements contributing to our attacks. There's a few examples, but there's plenty more positive and proactive. I'm not trying to bash our other options at left back as they have different qualities, but Calafiori's stride length because of his height and athleticism and his comfortability attacking the last line centrally and on the underlap make all these movements a bit more threatening and dynamic. He right now feels like our most capable, driven, attacking fullback option on the left. And so much of it is off the ball. And another thing I didn't see coming was his right foot and his lack of angle bias in his passing. I think when I saw him before, I thought he was a little bit heavy in his passing, both in terms of foot and direction, but there was this gorgeous moment in the Leicester game where he receives on the back foot, something he's really capable of doing with consistency, before driving inside and picking out a great ball into Martinelli off his weaker right foot. I watched that and went, all right, I was wrong. Thank you so much for Scott Willis for doing these for me on request. As you can see, here's Calafiori's passing broken down a little bit more, and this is in the league only. 
Red is incomplete, blue is key passes, teal is progressive passes, gray is completed. Long, medium, and short passing, both ways, outside or inside, passing into the center of the pitch with success from different locations at different angles. Very little bias. Look at where the passes start and end. That's the key on this point. That could be a left eight, and you'd be happy with how much he's connecting inside and outside in terms of the variety that we need. He doesn't run himself into corners with his passing. He goes where he needs to go and uses either foot, although of course preferring his left. Then look at where his progressive passes tend to end up in this graphic. And he's passing into areas that, for your left back, I'm happy with certainly. Dangerous locations, areas where a Martinelli, a Rice, whoever, can take the ball and capitalize. He's not going out to the wing constantly with a safe pass. He's finding dangerous areas inside and in the box. Really good. And thanks again to Scott, who you can find on X at Scott J. Willis. I've been so impressed with Calafiori's integration. To come to a new country, settle in so quickly, get dropped in away at Man City for your full Premier League debut and rise to it. It's really impressive. By all accounts, he's settled in brilliantly socially too. And he's even got a nickname already. Rico. Oh, Ricardo. How have I just got that? <laughs> yes, yeah, a bit of an obvious nickname when you work it out. <laughs> and the eye test is backed up by the data. Please account for small sample sizes here, but Data MB recently compared him to other fullbacks in the league per 90, and pre Southampton, this is what he was looking like. Aerial duels competed, tackles, possession adjusted tackles, accurate passes, accurate passes into the final third, all first. Accurate duels, one percentage, deep completions, accurate long passes, accurate progressive passes, all third and accurate short passes, fourth. I don't know how much I like the whole and he's a centre-back playing fullback thing because I don't really like locking players into positions particularly, but when you consider where he's played most of his football, the fact he's new to the league and the fact that our starts of the season fixture-wise have been really tough, it's, yeah, pretty insane. I do have one concern uh, and he is just turned 22. So if he didn't, I that would be more weird, frankly. But sometimes I think he is a little bit too proactive and it can cause him to get his distances wrong. Let me explain what I mean. While I feel there were other issues in the Haaland goal, and I don't wish to pin blame on one player, Calafiori was part of the picture of getting stuff wrong. As Savinia receives, he's too close. And because he's slowing himself to engage without crashing into him, as he should, the stutter step, he's flat-footed for a moment, so can't respond to Savinio's clever movement quick enough. By being this close, he's forced Savinio to make an early decision, and it doesn't pay off. If you're even here, just a fraction back, you delay the attacker, and when you take that moment to slow yourself before engaging, you don't leave that little space in behind you so easily accessible. If you're going to get that tight, you have to win it. Ben White does this superbly, getting the distances right pretty much every time. He also did it against Dibbling versus Southampton, as well as a couple of other times where he's got himself booked. As Dibbling receives the ball in this exact moment here, it's more actually the positioning for me than the distance. If he's just that side step to the left, he cuts off that lane and probably forces Dibbling back. But as it is, he gives him that small corridor of opportunity, again, as he slows himself to engage. Dibbling is brilliant, by the way, and he'll be at a top club in a few years, if not before. But Calafuri dealt with him all afternoon, and he would there, but he just doesn't quite get the angle right. However, I say all that, but these are pretty isolated incidents when you consider how many duels he's actually competing in. Number two, it's easy for me to sit here behind a computer and criticise. And number three, I, I kind of don't mind it. I'm not saying I want him to get done, but players get done. It, like, it happens. And so often he gets it so right and we love it when he does. He got it right basically every other time in these two games. The next time Savinio got it, he backed off a little bit. He learned his lesson and will continue to and we had to allow for that. And it's also exactly the type of energy we need, I feel. That proactivity. It goes over the top a touch. That first time he came on against Leon, I was like, all right, mate, chill out. But as I say, I love the proactivity. I've drawn a crude graph here to explain what I mean for you visual learners out there. Shout out. But basically, I felt for a long time that on the predictability, repeatability and structure versus chaos, unpredictability and moments argument, the order versus chaos axis. Chaos! That was, oh, that was such, that was, I was trying to do Jordan Peterson. That was terrible. We've just been a touch too far over to the right under Arteta. Just that shade too controlled. It's not about an overcorrection. And if I had to choose for my heart rate, I'd lean right too. But I've long felt we needed some kind of impetus from somewhere. I felt, as you know, over the summer, that that would come from the forward areas. Leal, Rashford, Osserman, whoever it was, I felt that's where it would come. 
Teams are like very complicated games of whack-a-mole. Fix one problem and another arises. But could we ease the burden on one of our wide players? Not that it's holding Saka back, by the way. Take the slight drop off in our defensive numbers, considering how far ahead we are, and gain that ability to get over those lines. Have those moments that we all feel, or I at least feel we all feel we need, in the UEFA Champions League. But as always, Mikel turns around and schools me. And I wonder if he's done that, just not in the way I called for in the summer. I wonder if he's got that unpredictability, that extra 1-2% just from fullback. Our left-hand side is about to go through a bit of a revolution as Marino and Calafiori settle in. Because we press so often to other teams left, our right, because of the nature of the profiles we have on the right, I wonder if Mikel sees that as almost the stability in our team on that right-hand side. We know what we're getting from Saka, the passes received and the output, the metronomic nature of Erdegaard, recycling and helping us progress, the consistency and stability of White, the simple security and dueling of Saliba. They're also composed and calm and efficient, and they're also almost always available. So what if the left can, facilitated by Marino, become a bit more fiery again? Gabriel showing us his passing teeth a bit more, as we've discussed. Insert joke about his teeth. I, I'm not clever enough to write that. Martinelli pulled inside more by Marino and Calafiori, now fit and firing again. And now, with Calafiori free to roam in possession as the spare man, free to show us this impetus, this personality, this stallion that we're seeing. He doesn't need to be in control of the game like Zinchenko having 60, 70 touches from left fullback. He's the one adding the fuel to the fire. It will never be this simple because you're never going to play the same way every week. But I wonder what Mikel's thinking, as we know he talks in units, as recently confirmed by Jorginho. So this is probably how he breaks up the team to some degree. Pods, duos, trios, units. He must be seeing these Calafiori performances and thinking, Fog. With that bravery, that security, that comfortability in tight areas and centrally pushing forward, progressing at six foot two without losing anything defensively, what knock-on effect can that have on the rest of the side? Is Calafiori the one to notch that graph one space to the left? The only thing I worry about is Mikel restricting him. But I can't see him doing that. Certain games, sure. But when we're as in control as we were against Leicester and Southampton, why would you? And also, can you restrict him? There's a YouTube channel called Joe English, run by a great guy called Joe who teaches English to Italians. And I used to work for him. I would teach classes for an hour in some evenings over Zoom to make a bit of money for a couple of years while I was getting this channel going. And I loved it. I loved it for many reasons. Teaching can be incredibly rewarding, especially when your students want to be there. But also culturally, it was great because every student, almost exclusively Italian natives, would tell you what they felt. And sorry to generalize, that's not what we do in the UK. Luckily, it was usually a positive opinion, but if they didn't understand, they'd tell you. If they wanted you to slow down, they'd tell you. If they didn't like an exercise, they'd tell you. And I love that. I love that transparency. No culture or no country anywhere is perfect, but I think we could use a bit more of that in the UK. And to me, just based on my experiences of meeting Italian people, I think I see a bit of that in Califiori. I'm going to play and I'm going to do me no matter what. You can put restrictions on me, but hey, I'm too good. You can't hold me down for long. And I love that. Look at his recent quotes. He loves it. He wants the responsibility. He wants to be on the front foot. It's the free spirit that I see in Italy that I love, that I also see in him. We'll dance and sing in public. We'll make the best food. We'll be unapologetically Italian and proud of it. I think he has that, and I think it's just what we needed. Mikel and Edu have signed yet another diamond. And with a bit more polishing, he'll be just perfect. If you like The Different Knock, you can support us on Patreon monthly, or you can buy us a coffee.